Our mind is the battlefield. The devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our mind. He takes his time to work out his plan. So now, we're going to examine a little bit about how this plan works by me sharing a parable with you, and it's not a parable that Jesus told. This is my own parable that I made up, and it's in this book, Battlefield of the Mind, and so you're just going to have to indulge me and let me read you a little story here. Mary and her husband, John, are not enjoying a happy marriage. <laughs> there is strife between them all the time. They're both angry, bitter, and resentful. They have two children that are being affected by the problems in their home. Strife is showing up in their schoolwork. The results of the strife in their home is showing up in their schoolwork and their behavior at school. One of the children is now having stomach problems because of his nerves. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm Mary and I'm married to John. <laughs> Many of you can already recognize where this is going. Well, Mary's problem is that she doesn't know how to let John be the head of their home. She's bossy. <laughs> she wants to make all the decisions, handle the finances, and discipline the children. She wants to work so she'll have her own money because she is independent, loud, demanding, and a nag. So you're probably thinking by now, well, I've got Mary's answer. She needs to be saved. She needs to know Jesus. Well, guess what? She does know Jesus. She received Jesus five years ago, <laughs> only three years after her and John were married. Do you mean there has not been a change in Mary since she's been born again? Well, yes, there has been some change. She now believes that she would go to heaven if she died. But she still lives under constant condemnation because she feels so bad about her behavior that she seems to have no ability to control. She does have some hope now, whereas she had no hope before she met Jesus. She was miserable and hopeless. Now she is just miserable. I'm sure Mary was a sweet girl that loved Jesus, but she had strongholds in her mind. And until they were broken, nothing was ever going to change for her. As a child, Mary had had an extremely domineering father who often spanked her just because he was in a bad mood. If she made one wrong move, he would vent his anger on her. For years, she suffered helplessly as her father mistreated her and her mother. He was disrespectful in all of his ways toward his wife and daughter. And Mary's brother, however, could do no wrong. It seemed as if he was favored just because he was a boy. <laughs> by the time she was 16, Mary had been brainwashed for years by Satan, who had been telling her lies that went something like this. Men really think they're something. You know they're all alike. You can't trust any of them. They'll hurt you and take advantage of you. Now, if you're a man, you've got it made in life. You can do anything you want. You can order people around, be the boss, treat people any way you please, and nobody, especially not wives or daughters, can do one thing about it. As a result, Mary's mind was resolved and steadfast. When I get away from here, nobody is ever going to push me around again. <laughs> I was sexually abused by my father who was alcoholic and violent and mean and this went on for years and years and I watched him come home every Saturday night a drunken mess many nights beat my mother my mom didn't know how to do anything about what he was doing to me and so she turned toward my brother and adored him and left me in the situation that I was in so I did not have a very good opinion of men I made inner vows I made a covenant with myself God wants to have a covenant with us to take care of us. He doesn't want us to have a self-covenant where we say, when I get out of here, nobody's ever going to hurt me again. I will take care of myself, and I will never ask anybody for anything. Now, some of you may not have a clue what I'm talking about, but how many of you do? How many of you get this, and you're like, been there, done that, know exactly what you're talking about? So now, 
Mary's got real problems because she comes into this marriage wanting to be loved, wanting to give love, but she's got a really, really, really bad attitude. And it comes from all the lies that Satan has told her all these years, taking one situation now and telling her every man is like that, everybody's like that, you can't trust anybody, you have to take care of yourself. <laughs> So now she's in a relationship with God who wants to take care of her, except she doesn't have any idea how to let God take care of her. She's a Christian, though. She goes to church. But she doesn't know enough to begin to realize, I have been robbed. The devil has lied to me. And we're going to have a turnaround in this life. Amen. Mary cannot control her actions simply because she does not control her thoughts. <laughs> and she doesn't control her thoughts because she doesn't even know that's an option. <laughs> now, the thing I have to get across tonight, just trying to lay a foundation, is that you don't have to think everything that falls in your head. The Word of God, when you know it, becomes a filter for your life. And I think about this sometimes like when I, when I try to watch television today, which gets to be interesting even trying to find something to watch. But the Word of God is like a filter for me. And it's like, you know, I, I can see two people they're on a date, next thing you know, they jump in bed with each other, and you know, before you can get the remote and try to change the channel. <laughs> and so you're aggravated about the whole thing. But you know the thing that's good for me, and I'm sure for many of you, is that don't tempt me to do anything because I have my mind, my, my word filter here. I know it's wrong. But I'm very concerned for all the people in the world who don't know it's wrong, and they're being educated by evil things, and so they think, well, that's just what you should do. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> the way that people behave on television is just downright stupid. It, I mean, they call it reality TV, and there is nothing reality about it. I mean, I get so tired of watching man kisses woman, woman begins to rip clothes off a man. You know what? I've been married today 47 years. I've yet to rip his shirt off of him. <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> whoa. And then all that stuff gives, you know, men stupid ideas, and then they're not happy with their wives, and, you know, like, well, why aren't you ripping my clothes off of me? Well, there is nobody ripping... <laughs> You may be thinking, dear Lord, that woman's crazy. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you the truth. If we don't talk about these things where we ought to be talking about them, how's anybody ever going to stay out of trouble? I don't need to just talk to you about religious doctrine. Jesus told me to go teach people how to live according to his word. So anyway, you understand what I'm saying. Now, let's talk about John for a minute, because John had some issues of his own. John needed to be taken the position as the head of the family that God intended him to have to provide spiritual leadership in his home. John was born again and knows the proper order for family life. He knows that he should not allow his wife to control the household, the finances, the children, and him. He knows all this, but he doesn't do anything about it except feel defeated and retreat into TV and sports. John lives in his recliner. <laughs> John should be doing a lot of things, but like Mary, he also has wrong mindsets because of the way he was raised. <laughs> Let me tell you something, if you were raised 
in a sane, even a reasonably sane home, you should thank God every day. <laughs> Let me tell you something, you are way ahead of the game. Because many of us were raised with dysfunction to the max. I mean, nothing was functioning according to anything normal. And so you come in with so much baggage that it takes you so much time to unpack. <laughs> so I'm just telling you <clears throat> that if you were raised by parents that were even halfway sane and even tried to be decent to you, you should appreciate them and just thank God for every little bit of sanity that you had in your life. And you should be a little more patient with those of us who didn't have it the way you had it. I tell you, my, Dave was a wonderful, spirit-filled, 26-year-old, good-looking, muscular, Lutheran young man. He loved God. He'd been raised by a godly mother, although his father did die from alcoholism. His mother the, the godliness in his home because of her overrode anything that could have been a problem from him. So moms or dads, if, if one or the other of the partner is not doing what they're supposed to be doing and causing problems, you hang on to God. You teach your kids what's right and you can overcome all that. And Dave was wanting to get married. He was praying that God would send him a wife. He was dating three different women at the time, so he was aggressive after it. He wasn't a man who just believed in prayer with no action. <laughs> he prayed and got about the business of dating. He was looking aggressively. He said he knew none of them was the right one for him. He said, God, give me somebody that needs help. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> Here I am. I tell you, all you people praying for somebody to marry and you want the perfect this and the perfect that and a spiritual giant and this and that and no flaws and on and on and on. Maybe God wants to use you to help somebody. Did you ever think of that? Oh, well, pressing right on. Well, yes, John should be doing a lot of things he's not doing, but he's also got mindsets that open the door for the devil to hold him captive. There's also a battle you see going on in John's mind. And this is the way it is. You've got two people married. They're not getting along. They're smiling at each other, strife in their heart, battling her mind, battling his mind. The devil's been working on both of them for years and years. They've got all these wrong mindsets. And there is just no hope without the Word of God. There is just absolutely no hope unless people learn the truth and let the truth set them free. We have to to learn how to think right if we ever expect to live right. And you can do your own thinking and you can do it on purpose. You don't have to think everything that falls into your mind if you've got enough of the Word of God in you that when a wrong thought comes, you it doesn't take you but just a few minutes and you think, that's not God and I'm not wasting my time revolving it around in my mind. Like Mary, John was verbally abused in his childhood. His domineering mother had a sharp tongue and frequently said hurtful things like, John, you're just never going to amount to anything. You're a failure. John tried very hard to please his mother because he craved her approval, <clears throat> like all children do. But the harder he tried, the more mistakes he made. He had a habit of being clumsy, and his mother always had something to say about it, told him what a klutz he was, so of course that made him nervous, and he dropped more and more things. So he always felt defeated. He experienced unfortunate rejection from children that he wanted to be friends with. Then he liked a girl at high school. She ended up rejecting him. Then a teacher rejected him, and so you get the pattern on and on and on and on and on. John is a low-key type person who simply chose not to make waves. For years he's been having thoughts directed into him that go something like this. Well, there's no point in telling anyone anything about what you want because I'm not going to listen anyway. If you want people to accept you, you just have to be quiet and go along with whatever they want. Just leave things alone. Nothing you say is going to make any difference anyway. There's no point in saying anything. The few times he tried to stand his ground on any issues, it seemed that he always ended up losing. So he finally just decided that confrontation simply was not worth the effort. 
I'm going to lose in the end anyway. So he reasoned, why should I even try anything? So he lives in his recliner. And Mary runs around ranting and raving. And then they go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> and sad to say, <laughs> this is a fairly accurate description <laughs> of many, not all, but many Christian families and Christian homes. God does not want us just to talk about victory. He wants us to have victory. He doesn't want us just to look forward to the good old days when we finally go to heaven and there's going to be no more crying and no more tears. Eternal life starts the moment that you receive Christ and eternal life means to have life as God is now living it. The Zoe life of God. We are supposed to have life the same way that God has life. Somebody give God a big praise. Now, the first thing that you have to make your mind up to if you're going to get through this process and the renewing of the mind is definitely a process. Everybody say process. process. You see, process has beginning and an end, but it's also got a middle. And many times the middle is a lot longer than we'd like it to be. When is this ever going to end? When is this going to be over? When am I going to change? When are you going to change? I hope that some of the things that I share with you this weekend will help you to do something that I did not know how to do, that nobody was teaching me how to do, but since I did it all wrong and learned the hard way, maybe you could, just maybe you could listen to me and I could save you some agony. Yeah. Spiritual maturity takes time. Lots of time. You're not going to do everything right. Those of you who received Christ tonight, all your sins were forgiven, but not just all the sins you ever had committed, every sin you ever will commit, and you will. We all make mistakes. But the good news about the gospel is that while we are making this journey, if we know who we are in Christ, we do not have to suffer from guilt and condemnation over every mistake that we make. That also is an attack on your mind. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And the moment that you make a mistake or even think you made a mistake or it even hints like you made a mistake, he's going to accuse you. Eh, there you go, see, see. You're never going to change. Surely you don't think God's going to answer your prayers. I don't even think you're saved. How can you even say, how, how can you even believe you're saved and act like that? And I'm telling you that if you really understand the truth of the gospel, that while you're making this journey, you can enjoy every moment of yourself and your life. I didn't enjoy a lot of my journey, but I would like my pain to pay off for somebody. And hopefully, it can be you. Now, I did learn, thankfully, maybe about 15 years ago, but I wasted the first maybe 16, 17 years just wandering around in the wilderness. We'll get around to talking about the Israelites and why they spent 40 years making an 11-day trip. <laughs> Some of you think, been there, done that, know exactly what you're talking about. Round and around, the same stupid mountain for the last 20 years. Don't get my way, get mad. 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 <laughs> Think I'll be happy when everybody changes. If you'll change, I'll be happy. I try to change you, you don't change. I can't be happy. <laughs> oh, it was a great day when I finally just heard from God that I was not to give somebody else the responsibility to keep me happy. That that was... Something that I had to work out between me and God. I couldn't get mad at Dave all the time because he wasn't making me happy and get mad at my kids because they weren't making me happy and mad at my boss because he wasn't keeping me happy. <laughs> your happiness is your responsibility. Uh-oh, I said your happiness is your responsibility. And nobody can make you miserable if you won't let them. Woo. 
This may take longer than one weekend. I don't know. <laughs> so I just want to say to you, if you're going to make this journey, you have to decide right now, tonight, that you're never going to give up. You're never going to give up. I don't care how many times you fall down. The righteous man falls down seven times, gets up again. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. What is due season? Only God knows and He's not telling. I don't know. We're all different. God has to deal with us all in different ways. He's got different plans for all of us. Some are a little more stubborn than others. Some are a little slower learners than others. The good thing about God is you never flunk out of His school because you get to keep taking the test over and over till you pass it. God will never give up on you, so you don't need to give up on Him. God delivers us, according to Deuteronomy 7, 22, little by little. That's what it says. Deuteronomy 7, 22. He and the Lord your God will clear out those nations before you little by little. <laughs> Who likes little? I don't like little. There's nothing about little that excites me. I like big, bold, aggressive, all, now, quick. I don't care anything about slow, little by little. The rest of that scripture says, lest the beast of the field increase among you. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> well, I believe that beast is pride. And I honestly think if God came and delivered us just whoosh, I tell you what, we would want to spend the rest of our life giving victory lessons to everybody we met. There would be not one shred of humility in us, nor would we have any understanding of what people are going through when they go through things. And let me tell you something. When you tell me, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, I'm having a hard time with this, I'm having a hard time with that, I know what you're talking about. I know. And when I share the Word of God with you, I didn't get this out of a sermon book. I am sharing my life with you. I have lived these things, and I know that 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 the Word of God works, and if you will learn it and apply it in your life, you can be completely transformed. No could be, if, maybe, you will be completely transformed by the Word of God. It is full of power to bring healing in every area of your life. Every area of your life. I just want to stop for a minute, Father. I want to pray for everybody in here and everybody that's watching by TV that has back problems. I thank you, Lord, from the very top of their spine all the way down to the bottom that everything lines up, all the vertebrae are healthy, all the discs are healthy. I ask you to heal people from injuries, and we ask you to touch them right now in the name of Jesus. Even people watching TV, touch them right now, praying the prayer of faith and asking you to heal people with back problems. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just have a little healing pause right there. Amen. Well, the only way that we are ever going to win the battle in the mind is to study the Word of God. Now, you know, I say that over and over and over to people, and I know from experience that the more of God's Word that you really know, the more it becomes a part of you, the less trouble you are going to have with your mind. There are, new, there are no drive-through breakthroughs, I like to say, but the truth will set you free. And what I mean by that is today we live in a society where everything can be done fast. We can drive through and get almost everything. But when it comes to having a, a, a renewed mind, it's going to take a little bit of work and effort on our part. Yes, we want to pray. We want to ask God to help us. We cannot do it without Him. But it's going to require studying the Word of God. You know, if you have not really studied the Word of God, I would like to suggest that you even just start with five, 15 minutes a day. 
Don't start somewhere that's overwhelming. Start somewhere small, and pretty soon you'll be seeing such good results that you're going to want to do it on a regular basis.